Hello and welcome. I'm Rachel Hopkin and this is How Curious from KGOU. Now, a short while back, a lady named Shirley Lorenz phoned up KGOU. She was calling from the Shattuck Windmill Museum and wanted to add an event to the station's community calendar. Jim Johnson, who's our program director, took the call. He's lived in Oklahoma practically his whole life and he'd never heard of the museum, he said, and he asked if I knew of it. I did not, but it definitely sounded like my cup of tea. So I decided to give Shirley a ring myself and in no time at all, we'd arranged for me to go and visit the place. This is lovely. You did not know what to expect when you came out to the farm. I didn't. So I went to the wrong place. And then I was coming this way and I was thinking, I can't see any windmills at all. I just, where are they all? Whoops, that's my keys. And then I saw windmills upon windmills. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, thank you. Well, come on in. Everyone who works at the Shattuck Windmill Museum is a volunteer. And several of them were there to greet me, including Doug Schoenhals. He's a lifelong Shattuck resident and has been involved with the museum since its inception in 1994. Its founder was a local lady named Phyllis Ballou. Phyllis Ballou came back to retire in this community and in her wanting to put up a windmill like her granddad had, she found someone to restore a windmill and he stated he wanted to start a windmill museum and she thought that would be a good idea. The restorer's name was Marvin Stinson. He loaned four windmills and then she put an ad in the paper that she would like volunteers to step forward. Uh, our first official meeting, we had nine people there. The next one, we had 20-some people. We formed a board and decided to go ahead with the process. What attracted you when you saw the ad? Oh, I guess I'm a perpetual volunteer. I just want to be involved in things to keep Shattuck going. And about how many volunteers are involved now? Not near enough. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them is, of course, Shirley Lorenz. She's also been involved since the museum's early days. I knew Phyllis as a child. We were childhood friends. When she came back here and started working on the park, we had a lot more contact. And I said, you know, you have to do it. It's the history of this area. I had told her then that I'd do whatever I could for the Windmill Park as long as I could. She has subsequently died, and so we're keeping it going. Doug took me to see Phyllis's windmill, the one that got this whole place started. It's kept inside to protect it. Gosh, what does it say on the side? It says Eclipse. By Fairbanks Morris and Company. Well, that restoration man did a great job, didn't he? He did. Mm, yeah. That is pretty gorgeous. Yeah. It's red and kind of tan. Lovely. When Doug stepped down as the museum's president in 2022, Van Hurst took over. He's a comparatively recent addition to the volunteer ranks. A number of years ago, I was purchasing the land out uh, west of Shattuck of Mrs. Ballou. On that land, there was this old windmill, and uh, we didn't fully realize that it had been donated to the museum until after the fact. Wait a minute, windmill. you bought this land thinking it came with a windmill and it didn't? It was not clarified in our minds that it was already given to the Windmill Museum until someone approached us and we said, what? <laughs> well, good, they can have it. <laughs> they so could that, have been lying. <laughs> <laughs> a wooden windmill without maintenance in this part of the country will finally just fall to pieces. So I was delighted that Mrs. Ballou had made arrangements. Even though Van is a relative newbie at the museum, he brought with him a great deal of windmill experience. I grew up with windmills. It was a source of water for our farm, uh, north of Shattuck here, about 15 miles. And uh, they have to be serviced regularly. Someone needs to climb up to the top, <laughs> take the top off of the windmill, and change the oil, or be sure it has oil in it. Well, you've got to realize that that's quite a ways up. And when it's turning, we need to be sure that it stops or it could knock you off. It's kind of windy out here, so that, that wheel is probably turning quite a lot. Well, we are supposed to put the brakes on and stop it. However, the brakes often malfunction. So I find that adventuresome, and uh, we always appreciated having water. Do you sing at all? Yes, I used to. You've got a beautiful voice. 
I could listen to you all day. Do you want to read the telephone directories? <laughs> all of the museum's windmills are designed to be set over a well and pump water to the surface. When the Cherokee outlet run opened in 1893, the land that was claimed was along creeks, rivers, and so on. The rest of it, they called it uninhabitable. Shortly thereafter, a lot of people started importing windmills, so the land became habitable. When the museum started, the windmills were mainly from local places. And of course, in this area, about all the windmills sold were dimpsters and air motors. So we didn't have much of a variety. However, Marvin Stenson was uh, connected with a windmiller association. Phyllis joined up and went to their annual convention, and there's all kind of windmills there. What does it take to transport a windmill? They're tore down. They're just little piles of junk that you haul around. <laughs> and that's truly what most of ours were. How come you're so good at fixing windmills? I wouldn't say that I'm handy at it. I said, Shirley's saying it's a gift. Uh, someone needs to do it, and I can do it. So, Doug showed me around the windmill park and told me about the tours he gives. I generally demonstrate one of the self-regulating wheels. Then it usually leads to uh, the railroad eclipse, which is one of the most impressive windmills in the park. It's huge and it's right by the road as well, yeah. so it's a real kind of signal. Santa Fe needed a lot of water whenever they expanded their route to the west. So they tried to place a windmill every seven miles. That way they had the water to generate the steam. Is that a privy? It started out <laughs> as a privy. <laughs> is it used uh, for anything now or is it yeah. just a, what is it? Uh, it's breaker boxes and timers. Oh, so it's providing power. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. turned the privy into very good use. <laughs> yeah. We and it doesn't even smell. <laughs> <laughs> As we heard, the museum started out with four windmills. It now has 64 altogether, two of which are recent arrivals and are waiting to be erected. Although a number of other states have windmill museums, including Texas, Kansas and Nebraska, Shattuck's Windmill Museum has garnered quite the reputation amongst people interested in windmills, many of whom attend the annual windmill trade fair. Every year, windmillers from around the world get together to buy, sell, and trade, compare notes and gossip and whatever it is they do. And we had one last year. It was the third one we've had in Shattuck. And they ask to come back to Shattuck. Are there enough hotels here to accommodate all the windmillers? No. Woodward is 30 minutes from here. Someone that'll come across the United States to a trade fair doesn't mind sleeping 30 miles away. The Windmill Museum is also very well known locally, not least thanks to the columns that Shirley writes regularly for a couple of the area's newspapers. In the process, she's learned a lot about windmills and the role that they played in this region. We always think of the windmills as the life force because it brought water to the surface. But I, as I was doing some research, I found out that the windmill served another psychological and emotional purpose. When the pioneers came here, this was extremely flat land. There is no vertical relief. The windmill provided that. When you travel, you go to have your pictures made and you look for a structure that goes up. I don't care if it's the Eiffel Tower, you know, Washington Monument, Mount Rushmore, it can be anything. When you look at pictures of the pioneers, so often they are gathered around the windmill. And when you were in the country driving along, sometimes you would see a windmill that was off the road. You could not see the farmhouse, but you knew someone lived there because there was a windmill. You notice the leaning over is not as bad as the raising up. I noticed that. <laughs> and sitting down isn't as bad as getting up. Our volunteer group, uh, almost all are in their 70s and 80s. The youngest volunteer we have is 52. The reality is a lot of 
young people today do not have the connection with windmills that the older ones do. And I want to make certain that the young people that are here today have some understanding of and appreciation for what the ancestors did and what it meant to the people here. I certainly felt grateful for all I'd learned about windmills and the vital role they played in this area during my visit to Shattuck. As I was getting ready to make my way back home to Norman, I noticed a sign outside the museum which read, Tune your radio to FM 90.3 to hear Windmill Willie's story about windmills. So I did. Its signal only lasted a couple of blocks, but it seemed a fine way to end my trip. Those are the windmills that are completely covered up. You don't see any gears or moving parts. It also brings this episode of How Curious to a close. Can you imagine having a climb up there every week? How Curious is a production of KGOU Public Radio. It's produced by me, Rachel Hopkin, and the editor is Logan Layden. David Gray composed our theme music. I'd like to say special thanks to E.A. Ray and Sharon Schultz Bradshaw, both of whom I also met during my visit to Shattuck. And please remember, if you have an Oklahoma story you'd like us to investigate, email us at curious at kgou.org. Race might be a hot topic right now, but for so many of us, talking about race is nothing new. On the Code Switch podcast from NPR, we go beyond the headlines and we go deep. Listen now.